morning, millennials. Welcome back to the morning toast. It is a Thursday that feels like a Wednesday here in New York City. Hey, Claude, HYD. Hey, guys. How you doing? Hey, Jax. How you doing? I'm feeling good. Um, you know, what a busy week, actually. This week really flew by. I had like something to do every day, which is be rare, be special, be unique. And it really makes time fly by when you have things to do. Like I have like four things to do today. You know what I'm doing later today? Hmm. I am recording oh, I do um, I, I, Jenna Ushkowitz and Kevin McHale. They have a Glee recap podcast. So they gave me an episode to watch and we're going to recap it. And I'm like so excited. I literally couldn't sleep last night. That's so exciting for you. Um, I think that's exactly where you're meant to be and what you're supposed to be doing like at this point in your life. And so I hope that it's fabulous. No, I have a feeling it's going to be quite fabulous. Me and Jenna have been texting. Yeah, that's right. I'm the new member of New Directions. Um, that's as fabulous as well. What yeah, was the name for characters? Tina. Tina Cohen Chang. Those last few seasons were not kind to Tina. Well, actually, I think the first few seasons were not kind to Tina. They made her character fake having a speech impediment and like fake being goth. And then it turns out like she was really just like not goth and like not had a speech impediment. And they kind of glazed over her introduction to the series as being like kind of fucked up. Yeah, no, there were some things that could have um, been addressed differently on the show. But, you know, there were so many different characters and there's only so much time in the prime time. I mean, can you imagine the outrage now if a um, a student that was supposed to be a handicapped was cast as a non-handicapped person? Like, already Kevin McHale yeah. is not in a wheelchair. Yeah, very true. And he actually spoke about that on our show. He was like, I know, like, I can't even talk. Like, I'm sure he gets that all the time. Yeah, it was just a different, different time, times. I guess, even though it wasn't that long ago. Anyways... It's kind of gloomy here in New York, which I'm so here for because the nice weather just makes me sad that I'm not outside. But when it's gloomy, I'm like, well, I would be inside anyway. So yeah, that's I'm, feeling, true. I'm feeling good about the day, ready to take it on. I am going like- today to get um, an antibody test. So um, I'm nervous. I don't like getting blood taken. Yeah, they do take a substantial amount of blood. Like it's not like a finger prick. It's a vial, a nick vial. And I feel as though you're going to freak out. Yes, I do have a flair for the dramatics. You have a flair for the dramatics, but it's really not a big thing. It's pretty quick. What can I say? It's my love of the theater. I'm a thespian at heart. You're just performing everywhere that you go. Wait, we have a really exciting update today at yes. one o'clock Eastern time. So probably a mere 30 minutes after you're listening to this episode, if you listen when it drops, we are launching TMT masks on shoptmt.com, shopmorningtoast.com. And they're so sweet. They're so sweet. There's four different options, some toasty ones, some tie-dye. It's fabulous. So make sure to go to shopmorningtoast.com. There is unlimited stock, so no one is going to be able to miss out. You have until Sunday to place your orders. So take your time. Get Send it to your friends. You have four days. No, ru- no rush. No stock. You can get as many as you want. Shopmorningtoast.com. And thanks. Four days. There's four different mask styles. They're all so cute. And we made some of them so that they would match your existing merch. That way, like your sweatshirt and the mask that you get will already match. And I'm just so excited. We've been working really hard on these. And we're excited that you are going to get to order them. So pre-orders start today, 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Go until Sunday night. Get your masks. Get your masks, but first, listen to this episode. We have a fabulous episode planned for you. Um, before we dive in, you know, we got to set ourselves up for success. Today's word of the day, Jackie, courtesy of Miss Marion Webster, is an, it's a nod to one of my favorite shows, Younger. The word is empirical. Oh, wow. And originating Within, in. How does or it spell? How is E-M-P- it spelled? E M P. Okay. E-M-P- okay. EMP. It means originating in or based on observation or experience, relying on experience or observation alone, often without due regard for system and theory. By the way, I am so empirical. That's not a good thing, it sounds like. Well, no, it just means like I say things based on my experience, not based on whether or not they're fact, which is like literally me. Yeah, maybe your viewpoint can be viewed as empirical at times. 
And you know what? I'm totally okay with that. Empirical, I get that it's kind of a negative word, but it sounds fucking fabulous and royal. It does sound fabulous. So hopefully when you say like, oh, I'm so empirical in my thinking, people will just assume it's a fabulous positive thing. Yeah. I'll just assume that they don't know the word of the day. No, they definitely don't know the word. Unless they're a toaster, in which case we love them. Yeah. Because they'll know in? the word of the day oh, we're also if gonna- they are a toaster. Yeah, I got that. Okay. Um, we're also going to recap Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, which was meh. Mm. I liked it. I thought it was um, a good non-important episode. Like not every episode is going to be their, you know, season finale. And I actually thought there was a lot going on in this episode. I love Santa Barbara and I just want to go there one day. It reminds me of the politician and I just think it's fabulous. I knew you were going to be focused on the Santa Barbara of it all. Like the house is so stunning. I love that they went there. That little wharf that they went to was so cute. And they were just like walking and taking bikes. And that was a strange turn of events for the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. But um, I really liked the the setting. I really did. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts. So we'll dive in after the Fast Five. So without further ado, Jackie, take it away. Let's get into the Fast Five stories that you need to know before you wake up and take a bite out of your morning toast. Ow. First story, the big story of the day, very sad, devastating news. Scott Disick and Sophia Richie break up after nearly three years together. It is over for Scott and Sophia. A source confirms to page six that the stars have broken up, saying the relationship ran its course, but that other issues, including Disick's past traumas that led him to rehab, contributed to the split. Quote, Scott had gotten back into his old ways and Sophia got fed up. They had been quarantining separately, which also took a bit of a toll on their romance. The source added that Disick's relationship with ex Courtney, the mother of his children, weighed on Richie. Quote, Courtney didn't make it easy for her, the source claimed, and you can only tolerate that kind of treatment for so long. I feel like that last there's part so is many... um, a little bit not true. Yeah, there's so many different layers to this. I feel like at no point was ever really Courtney like a factor in Scott and um Sophia's relationship like obviously they co-parent but beyond that I don't really see see that second half of the story I agree I'm like sad about this obviously because I like them together but I just liked Sophia being a part of the Kardashian crew like that's the personally like the loss I'm taking on the most um but I just really like I know a lot of people ship them I just like don't mean this this I just hope this doesn't mean he's getting back together with Courtney no I don't think so either and I feel like definitely maybe Courtney was um in obstacle in the relationship in the beginning but three years later she's been on the show like she's with the kids she's best friends with Kylie I feel like they had figured out how to be a blended family so I don't think that that was the issue anymore but maybe Scott is going through stuff I just I love these two like I'm gonna hold out hope that they get back together but I don't want to waste my time you know I'm maybe I just need to like move on build a new ship like it's gonna take some maybe time the- but I could but Jackie, they've broken up before right I don't, why does this one feel so final? Like, I feel like they- Because it was before, widely like, reported, like, as yeah, fact. Like, Chris Jenner was emailing everyone. Yeah. Usually when they've broken up, it's been kind of speculative and not in every single publication, but this is, like, reported as fact, and I'm just assuming that it is true. He just celebrated his birthday. We didn't see her there. I'm going to take this one on its face and say that it's, it's the truth. It's the curse of quarantine. It, it has, there's something in the air. Yeah, there is something in the air. Either you're breaking up or you're getting pregnant. So let's play a little game. Who are we shipping these two with? Like when life goes back to normal. Like I really want Sophia to stay in like in the Calabasas gated community ecosystem. Like who could we set her up with? Like French Montana. Like who still hangs Rob. around the Kardashians? Sophia and Rob. I, I just don't think it's going to work for me. I mean, I'll just, anything to be sister of Kylie for Sophia. Yeah, but then, like, if she gets with, with Rob, like, hypothetically, like, she really couldn't ever get back with Scott. Like, we need, like, a Kardashian outsider to, like, hold on to her until Scott, like, works through his traumas and is ready to take on the relationship again. Hmm. I mean, maybe she could just do her own thing for a while. I hope her and Kylie will still be friends. Me too. Like, you would think with the Kardashians that there's so many politics and, like, 
certain people would like you would honestly think at the beginning that none of them would have been friends with Sophia because she's like Scott's new girl but they always like they always just when you think one thing about them they always flip it on its head and it's like they really embrace Sophia so and even like with French Montana like he always sticks around and even though him and Chloe dated very briefly a million years ago he's invited to Christmas every year he's just one of those people who I think like vibed with them so they're always surprising me I don't know I, I hope that Sophia sticks around I like her but um I was reading some blinds that um, Sophia's family didn't like Scott. Well, we had known that to be true because Lionel said some stuff, but I would have thought after three years and like they seemed so good together at a certain point, it's like the proof is in the pudding. Yeah. It's a good, it's a good thing of pudding. The pudding's delicious. Right. So, and also that seems like that was something that was always there, just like Courtney. So why now? Why three years later when, we're, when it seems like we're all in a great place? Are we going to give up on this? Well, it definitely has a lot to do with what Scott's going through because we know he just went through this um, trip to rehab. So the timing makes sense in the sense that he might not be able to give himself to a relationship. He's really dealing with a lot. So yeah, I hope that that's not the case, but I think that it is. And that makes me really sad because Scott's a good person and he lost both of his parents at the same time. And it was just like so sad. And he doesn't have any family. And I don't know. I feel like, I feel like he needs a hug and like he needs it from Courtney and she's like not giving it to him like a friendly hug. Yeah. But he gets them from like Chloe and Kim and I think yeah, he'll Kim be okay. and him are really close. Yeah, I love watching their friendship. Um, he definitely has a lot to work through, and I'm glad that he's now taking the time to do those things. I just yeah. hope that he'll find love again soon. In a hopeless place. Yes. Oh, bravo. T- oh, no, someone tweeted, like, when you would think of Rihanna's lyrics, we found love in a hopeless place. What place do you automatically think of? I saw Bravo's response, and it was epic. I what personally – I think of the jug at Colgate because that song used to always play there. And then like if you met someone at the jug, it was like kind of like grungy and but like you could find love in a hopeless place. Yeah. I also think of it as just like a dirty club. Yeah. I think you're meant to. But Bravo responded the Regency, which is fucking hilarious. Whoever runs the Bravo Watch What Happens Live um, social media literally should be a case study for all brands. Like, their TikTok is so good. They have made so many sounds on TikTok go viral. Like, she was ugly. She is ugly. You can't call someone ugly. Like, they just do such a good job on their social media. Like, especially the Watch What Happens Live accounts. Um, whoever does, is doing that deserves a raise. I hope they get it. Me too. Okay, next story is also- Social media are notoriously underpaid. That's true. Next story is also a big story of the um, day today. YouTuber Mika Stauffer reveals she, quote, rehomed her son who has autism two years after she adopted him. YouTuber Mika Stauffer and her husband James have announced that they have decided to, quote, this is their word, rehome their son Huxley, who they adopted nearly three years ago from China. Mika and James said that they weren't aware of what it would be like to take care of Huxley, who has autism. Quote, once Huxley came home, there was a lot more special needs that we weren't aware of and that we were not told, James said in a video shared on Tuesday. Quote, for us, it's been really hard hearing from the medical professionals a lot of their feedback and things that have been been upsetting, he continued. We've never wanted to be in this position and we're trying to get his needs met and help him out as much as possible. We truly love him. The wife added that there's not an ounce of our body that doesn't love Huxley with all of our being. There wasn't a minute that I didn't try our hardest. And I think what Jim is trying to say is that after multiple assessments, after multiple evaluations, numerous medical professionals have felt that he needed a different fit and that his medical needs, he needed more. Do I feel like a failure as a mom? Like 500%. She said that Huxley was living with a new mommy in a forever home. Okay, and I read from a reporter on Twitter confirming that um, he's in a foster home. So that is not a forever home. And um, this story is very, very, very disturbing on so many levels. Um, Because, first of all, they crowdfunded from their followers raising money to help them adopt. Like, I guess, I mean, I don't know what the costs are, but adopting a child from another country is very expensive, I've heard. So they crowdsourced the money. Um, they were actually at one point talking about adopting another child and then they just went silent. They deleted every comment. People asked them like, where's Huxley? Where's Huxley? And now this video comes out and it's just really disturbing um, to think about on so many levels because you have to imagine if, you know, one of their biological children 
was diagnosed with special needs or, you know, was growing up with different behavioral issues, would they have rehomed their biological child? I don't know them, but I'm going to go ahead and say no. Right. And once you adopt a child, like, into your house, like, they are your child. It's so, this is such a disturbing story. And, like, at first, I'm like, you know what, this is weird. But as long as the kid is happy and in a good place, like, that's all that matters. But now knowing the kid might spend, like, a lot of time in the foster care system, um, I just have a pit. Like, this is a fucking terrible story. This is a fucking terrible story. Um, There's just no way around it. Like, who does this? I don't know. I've been following it since yesterday morning, and I wanted to talk about it yesterday um, on the toast, but there were no, like, news articles written about it. It was just, like, blogger drama. So we waited till today, and I'm glad we did because more information came out about it. I'm just – I'm so curious as to, like, who who are these people? I don't know. I, I've never heard of her as a blogger before, but she has, like, 160K. Um, and but they have a lot four- on YouTube. Her and her oh. husband both have YouTubes. And they have four other children. Yeah. And I don't know. I'm, I, I just don't even know what the right thing is to say because, of, like, you know, raising a child with special needs is difficult. And I have so much respect for people who do. But it's like, you don't just give up. Like, you don't just give up. No. It's, I, I don't need, it's such a weird story. Like, I never thought I would be, like, speaking about this. Yeah. No, it's such a weird story. It gives me such a pit. And to hear that she, what she said was untrue, that he's not in a new home, the child, and that he's in a foster home. No, he's in a new home. He's not in a forever home because I think right. the whole concept of foster homes is that they're temporary, right? Yeah, yeah, No, but he, that he's not in a forever home. Yeah. No, it just gives me a pit. Like, because at first it was like, all right, you are weird, but at least the kid is being taken care of. But now I just feel like his whole future is up in the air in a country he wasn't born in. Like, he, this is all so new to him. And I don't know. I just... I feel like more could have been done on behalf of these bloggers. Yeah. I agree. This is terrible. Terrible. The comments have just been like, people are, people are mad. Well, at first she was being like, um, police woman commenter. Like I saw only positive comments and I'm like, how can you even say something positive about this? Like, because whether or not you agree with what they did, like it's still a terrible situation, whatever angle you look at it from. So I guess now because there's been so much press, there's such an overwhelming amount of comments that they can't police them. But at first I was seeing 90% overwhelming majority, like positive, like mommy comments. Like you did what you had to do. You're not a bad mom. Jeez, that's crazy. This is going to be like a Netflix documentary in like a year. I could just feel it. I know. I feel like everything that happens now, everyone's just like sniffing around. Like, would this be good for a miniseries Netflix? No, totally. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, well, some, some happy motherly news. Sasha Peters from Pretty Little Liars is pregnant. She's expecting oh. her first child with Hudson Schaefer. Sasha Peters has a baby on the way. On Wednesday, the Pretty Little Liars alum announced she's pregnant and expecting her first child with husband Hudson Schieffer two years after they tied the knot. Quote, we are so beyond excited to finally share our sweet news with all of you. We will be welcoming a precious little human this October. Peter shared on Instagram posting a photo of Schieffer kissing her growing baby bump. That is so cute. Those Pretty Little Liars girls are just like all thriving in their own respective ways. Mm Mm-hmm. I love Sasha Peters. Like, I just have a warm spot in my heart for her, and I'm so happy for her. Me too. This is really cute. It's just so funny how, like, it wasn't too long ago that all these actors were playing high school kids. So you think that they're so young, like, they were, you know, 18 a little while ago, but they're actually all, like, almost in their 30s, right? Well, she's 24. Oh. So she might have been more appropriately cast than some of the other people. Right, like Train Belisario, me thinks is well. She much just older. has like sixty-year-old energy. She has a mature vibe. Yeah, she's mature. Are you gonna look up how old she is? Yeah, yeah. Train Belisario's thirty-four. Wow. Sasha Peters is twenty-four. Ashley Benson is thirty. Shay Mitchell's thirty-three. Lucy Hale is thirty. All right, so I was ma- and Janelle Parrish is thirty. So I was making an argument for everyone. I didn't realize that. Um, yeah, except Sasha for Peters this girl, is so much younger. Yeah, I feel that. Well, some good news. 
All Jewish songs are just like sounds. Like, if you don't know the words, it's just like. If you just do na 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 la la la, like, you got it. Yeah, it's really so true. You can know the words to any song. It's just like it's just yeah. like doing watermelon. Yeah, like or you they say if you like mouth the alphabet, you look like you know the lyrics to a song. So let's do Hava Nagila Hava Nagila Hava Nagila Be Yismecha Hava Neran. That was good. <laughs> yeah, I think that looks good. Okay, next up, um, in some Relatable news. CeeLo Green hopes to come out of quarantine 30 to 40 pounds lighter. Wait, what? CeeLo Green is so random. He's so random, but he's hoping to come out of lockdown in better shape. Quote, I definitely try to be mindful of what I eat, especially with the support of my fiance, Shani. In a perfect world, when I come out of quarantine, I would like to be 30 to 40 pounds lighter. He, the voice judge says that he's exercising at home. Fortunately for us, we live on a Georgia ranch that is about 10 acres, so we can go out and walk a mile and still be in the confines of the house. The first thing I wanted to do when I got money was to get a ranch. Speaking our language. Speaking our language. I love CeeLo Green. Me too. He has such an interesting career Um, because he was like kind of randomly cast on The Voice, like because nobody really knows his name. They knew him from Gnarls Barkley and that song Crazy, which is like honestly one of the most perfectly written songs of all time. And then he came out with um, F you. Fuck you. Yeah. And that was also like a total cultural reset, but they were like 10 years apart. And then he went on The Voice and then mysteriously disappeared. Um, And he's had such an odd career in my mind, but he's like a cutie. He's such a cutie and he's trying to use this time to get into shape, which is what I thought I was doing. And I put in like two to three really good weeks and I gained weight. So I was like, why don't I just go back to how I was doing before when when I thought I was gaining weight and I was actually staying the same. Maybe you're gaining muscle. Maybe from all the pelotoning, but also maybe like I'm just gaining the weight. Like maybe it was a delayed weight gain, you know? My body's trying yeah. to trick me. Another weird thing CeeLo Green did in his career that's memorable is there was a viral video of him sitting in a recording studio using an Android. Remember when all those Androids were blowing up on planes? Yeah. <laughs> and one of them blowed, blew up in his hand and it's the craziest video. And then I heard it was fake. Oh, I never heard that part, but I remember that video. Yeah, that was it was crazy. like it's. It's a black and white, like, security footage from the recording studio. Honestly, if you Google CeeLo Green, it's so funny. Google, like, s- iPhone, uh, no, Android thing, CeeLo Green on YouTube. It's so funny. Damn. Well, I'm glad he's doing well in the queue. Jealous of that farm chum in life. I know. I need a ranch in Georgia. Like, that's it. That is it. Okay, are you ready for our fifth and final story? So soon, yeah, I guess. Because it's a little... Mm-mm. <laughs> Nope. It's a little book news. Oh, you mean a little book news? <laughs> a little book news? <laughs> book news. <laughs> it's also just like not how one reads going to die from pain. No, I look like I'm praying, like very devout, like. I'm praying. No, if you want it to be like, you have to scan the whole page. Scan the whole page. Oh yeah, Book that's true. News. Have you have you ever seen those like professional speed readers? No. Oh my god, you haven't. Those videos are crazy. They take like huge stacks of papers, like as big as you, and they take the paper and they're like, "How do we know for they're reading it?" You don't. I, I saw one too. on the news once. They were reading like um. Some bill was passed and they were like doing, it was like such a dumb segment. It was obviously like the news was really dry that day and they got a speed reader to come like read the whole legislation. (laughs) We need to do shit like that because (laughs) that's where we're at. Yeah, we're so desperate. 
We're so desperate. Okay. Like, I just want to have someone come on the toast and like wax my upper lip on camera. Oh my God. I just, I would love that. I think that's a good idea. Speaking of people who could come on the toast, is T-H-E-O around? No, he's with his F-A-T-H-E-R. Hate to see it. Rats. Okay. Fifth and final story. A little book news. <laughs> The Hunger Games prequel sells 500,000 copies in its debut. Suzanne Collins' new book, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, released last Tuesday, reintroduces readers to the world of Pan Am. And the, the, I mean, that's how they say it, right? Pan Am. Pan Am. Pan Am. Pan Am. Yeah, like the Actually, it's Pan Am. It's Pan Am. And the villainous tyrant, President Coriolanus, Coriolanus, Coriolanus? No. President Snow. Cornelius? Adi- no. Coriolanus. Empirical? <laughs> <laughs> a decade after the Hungry East series had apparently ended, readers were clearly ready for, ready for more. The new Suzanne Collins book sold more than 500,000 copies last week, even as many of the country's bookstores were closed or offering limited service because of the coronavirus pandemic. The total includes print, ebooks, and audiobooks, according to the publisher. Scholastic. I mean, honestly, the queue has been, I really think, really great for the book community, including the redheads. Um, for the and I do think that this is just like an interesting factoid that like a, a whole new generation of Hunger Games like is well on its way to becoming like the first one. Yeah. And I think like back in the day, maybe selling 500,000 books like wasn't so crazy. Like it was. Like, the top books did that, but given the fact that, like, we've just evolved so much, like, I don't know how much you used to, but, like, now, I feel like really good books sell, like, a hundred to 500,000 books. Like, it's just not what it used to. So, the fact that, like, in pre-order, they're almost at a million is crazy. Yeah. No, the book came out. It's not just pre-order. Oh. It came oh, oh, out oh. Um, on Tuesday, I think. Yeah, I would love so to How much get, does maybe- a book cost? It depends if you're Kindle or um, hardcover or paperback. How much is a Kindle? A Kindle's about like $11, $12, but I'm sure hers is. Um, and then a hardcover is like $30. So what's the middle 25. of that? 25 Say like 18 Are you trying to figure out how much money she made? That's $9 million. That's crazy. That's really Good crazy. for her. Yeah, but also Kindles and eBooks. Like, if you, there's really no cost of production versus a book. You know, you have to think about those things. That's very true. That's very very true. No cost of goods. No cost of goods. Speaking of, I'm wearing this really cute um fan merch for the Redheads. It's not like official Redheads oh, merch yet. I wore mine yesterday. Right, it's the same company. It's the same company. Yet, yeah. um, a toaster like fantasies. That's so cute. It's called Bro Denim. They're toasters. They're so nice. And I just, I love this sweatshirt and I, I love the redheads. I need to start our book soon. This book that I'm reading, I've never read a book slower in my whole life. It is 500 pages, but still, like I literally read like 4% a day. That's not how I read, but I think I just- Is it 500 same. pages on Kindle? Is Kindle pages the same as human pages? No, no. It's 500 and something pages of book. On Kindle, it's like thousands of tap throughs. Got I mean, it. Okay. Compute. I was wondering that. Compute. Yeah, I measured by- I measure by book pages. Um, should we dive into the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills recap, which was on last night? There was no Vanderpump Rules the night before, so I like forgot about cable TV. It was so weird. Mm-hmm. But this episode, it was good. We picked up everyone met at Kyle's and went to Santa Barbara. Kyle is just being so weird, like about everything. Like I thought it was like she was finally going to calm down when she invited to read over before they left to Santa Barbara, just to like clear the air. And basically, she excuse me. <laughs> She That's invited Dorit over just to, like, rehash it again. And, like, she was, like, she was just wanted to, like, say her feelings and then be, like, let's just sweep it under the rug. And then, like, when Dorit would respond, she was, like, so taken aback. It's, like, you just invited her over to sweep it under the rug, but let you get your side out. Yeah. In this episode, she was reminding me, weirdly, of Lisa Vanderpump. Just the way she was, like, engaging with the group, like, saying sarcastic, mean things. I was just, like... Is this just maybe, you know, when you're on this show for this long, you become that way? Or, like, she's filling the void of Lisa Vanderpump? I don't know. Yeah, she was also really reminding me, looks-wise, of, like, early seasons, Kyle, because she blew out her bangs, and so they were a little volumized up front. And she really looked like season one, season two, Kyle Richards, and I was having major flashbacks. 
Oh, interesting. Um, okay, let's talk about the big fight between Denise and the women about the children. And like, I went on Twitter afterwards and I agree, like for the first time ever, like I agree with like the popular opinion on Twitter. So I don't know if that makes my opinion popular or unpopular, but I felt like I was completely on Denise's side. No, see, I wasn't. Honestly, it depends. There were so many parts of the fight. Like I thought Lisa was really coming for Denise in so many weird ways. Not only weird because they're such close friends, but just like any, like Lisa was just being off. But at the same time, like, Denise did make it a bigger deal and the women ran with it but like she was the one who made it a big deal and like Erica apologized and she still was going on and on about it so I thought that the women were being definitely a little harsh but Denise like kind of invited it yeah well I think it really bothered her and like she it wasn't something where it's like okay this bothers me but whatever it's over it's like I want to make sure that this never happens again. And then for the women to call her like a hypocrite because of what she does in her adult life when there's children around. And then Erica making that asinine comment about um, the 14 year old probably having threesomes was, was just, it was not right. Also, Lisa Rinna was so uninvolved in this. Like she wasn't even talking in the conversation. She wasn't even one of the people Denise told us to. And she's one of Denise's closest friends. Like why was she like so excited to join the pylon? And I just was like- bothering me. I thought Denise handled herself so well. I do think there is a complete like line in the sand when it comes to children. And whether you agree with Denise or not, like we're not going to talk about threesomes in front of her children. Okay. Like good to know. I'm sorry that we even put you in that position in the first place. Oh, and her kids' friends were there. And what if they are telling her parents? Like it's just a huge fucking pit for her. And I think she had a pit and she shared it with the group. Yeah, but, like, honestly, I I see the side of the women who are, like, don't invite us to your, like, she should know better. Like, she's hanging out with this woman. The, she has been hanging out with these women for at least a year. Like, things always take a turn when they drink and they talk about, like, crazy things. And it's, like, to me, she should have known better than to even have the kids and their friends there or to literally see them right next to the adults. And at the end of the day, like, these women show up to film and this is their job and they need to be funny and they need to be outlandish. And it's, like, it's just like, don't invite me somewhere where I'm going to be restricted. Like, I get that. And it does seem odd coming from Denise, given how open she's been on TV that her kids could possibly see about the hookers, about the happy endings. And now it's like, now you want to tell us to calm down? Like, I totally get why it feels hypocritical. Okay, I see what you're saying about they have to be able to, like, film and be themselves, but they go to, like, swanky events all the time where it's like, we can't do this here. There's always something where it's like, okay, we can't fight here. You want to come to my daughter's launch event? Like, you can't flip out. So when there's a t kid's table next door, just the adults, you can be, like, fun and funny and just not have, like, inappropriate conversations. And I think that for Denise – she uh, clearly doesn't let her kids watch the show. And there's a difference between doing something on TV or overhearing it in your own house as a child. That is a very interesting parallel to draw. Like all the women coming at Sutton for even thinking of, you know, having a bitch fit anxiety. In front of the, the children. Launch. Right. But Lisa Rinna has apparently no qualms about the women saying, you know, dirty things in front of Denise Richards' kids. That's actually very good. This is why I don't like to fight with you. Like, that was a fabulous parallel. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, um, I don't realize that you made such a good point because you, like, glazed right over it. Wow. Thanks. You're just full of compliments tonight. Um, I... I also think that Denise just handled herself really well. And maybe if she hadn't, I wouldn't have taken her side. But I felt she was so calm and collected. I also, like, really love that Dorit silently has her back. You know? I just love Dorit. I just love Dorit. Like, even when they were talking about her before she got there, Dorit, like, refused to participate. And that's just a good friend. And Lisa Rinna just lives for it. And her asking, like, what's it like to film a threesome? And all of these crazy questions at, at this awful, awful dinner. And it's like, we went to dinner at Denise's house and we couldn't not, like, be so crazy and talk. But we're here, adults-only trip, Santa Barbara, let's go wild. And we can't even, like, have an interesting conversation. I was really disappointed, honestly, that Garcelle didn't come because I already felt like she was a little bit behind in getting involved with the girls in the drama. Like, it hasn't been that many episodes, but Sutton's had her fair share of punches. And Garcelle, I just felt like this really set her back even more. And I would have loved for her to be there. Yeah, especially because it seems like Denise and Garcelle are on the same page about just life. And mm -hmm. also, I'm starting to feel like Garcelle is actually too busy to be doing this show. Like the women yeah. always talk about their projects and they're so busy and we're stressed and we're tired. And, you know, I, like everyone tries to compete with each other about how busy they are. 
but I think our cell is officially too busy if you can't make the cash trip in Santa Barbara. Which is literally like a drive away. It's not even a flight. Yeah, it's one of the lower lifts of being a real housewife of Beverly Hills. I agree, which was really upsetting because I would have wanted her to be there. Um, I just found the whole episode to be so strange because I've been watching this franchise from the beginning and I've always pretty much felt like Kyle was really like the center. You know, she wasn't always like so crazy. She wasn't starting fights and she for the most part took the side of the person that she thought was right. And I just feel like everything that comes out of her mouth this season is so unreasonable and so illogical and I just cannot like get on board with any of it. Yeah. I agree. I, it'd be interesting to like go back and watch old seasons like through the lens of like, has she always been this way? But there's always been a bigger manipulator in the group. And, you know, Kyle was always like really close with Lisa Vanderpump. And I think maybe Lisa Vanderpump took a lot of the shouldering of people calling her a villain. Not that Ky- I think Kyle's a villain, but she is behaving differently this season. I feel like it, the way that I see it is just like she feels like now this is her show. Like she broke up a friendship of hers to like liberate these women from Lisa Vanderpump. And, and now I want everyone to behave the way I see fit. Yeah, I was really disappointed in her reaction and just interactions this episode with Erica because she owes Erica a major apology for saying something so mean to Erica in her own fucking house. And not only did she not apologize, she stood her ground and then continued to make fun of Erica's outfits the entire episode. Yeah, I I do think she owes her an apology. And also that's another point where like Erica, I just like, you know, I love her. I just like really wasn't um, on her side this episode because I feel like when it comes to being in her house, there's so many rules. You can't like, you know, the way you, with Tom there, like you just have to act a certain way. And so for her to like not understand that Denise might have that same sort of boundary in her house with her kids, like just didn't ring like totally. Well, I'm an, I'm right an Erica sympathizer and I feel like she understood that Denise was upset and she apologized. And I feel like in her mind, like that should have been enough. And the fact that Denise kept bringing it up, that's what upset her. She didn't really take any issue with how Denise was feeling, but it's like, what's the point in apologizing if we're not going to move on? Yeah, I agree with that. And I also think Erica like really does not do well when she feels like she's being judged for being like promiscuous. Anything. Like, so when it's a threesome and it's like, everyone's talking about her threesome, like she really does not like that. Like she's happy to talk about it when she brings it up and like she wants to share with the group. But now when it gets like weaponized against her, there's a very similar feeling when the whole like stress Dorit PK thing, when she like, that's how it started that Dorit was like accusing her of not wearing underwear on purpose. And like Erica just does not stand for that. Which I love. And that's why we respect her. Yeah. 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 Overall, it was I, I thought episode. it was I thought it was really an interesting episode and, and the tides are turning and I want to go to that house in Santa Barbara. I just want to go to Santa Barbara. That house was beautiful, except the woman who was in charge of like introducing them to the house, who obviously was living in a pre-COVID America because she was hugging all these random strangers and sudden was like, no, I don't hug. That was so funny and so weird and probably the best part of the episode. Yeah, I'm feeling sudden more and more. Um, Me too. When she said that, like, she's not a hugger, I was like, I can fully relate. Thank you very much. Um, and she was bringing, she was making good points in the group setting, also. So she wasn't bothering me, and um, she's making strides. Yeah, she's found a balance of being relevant but not annoying. Yeah, well, she's kind of just staying out of the frame. She's going to have to get her hands dirty soon. But right now, I think she's in a good, good like, she's on the bench, but she's she's doing like good cheering. So is Garcelle. Garcelle is going to have to, you know, pull up her bootstraps and get to work. Well, Garcelle's not even on the bench. Like, she's not even at the game in the stands. Right. She's in Nashville. Yeah, she's in the car. It's, um, it's frustrating because I really like her. I need more. I need more, too. But Well, Well, I'm hoping that in a lot of ways being on this season will affect her career in a positive way. And they'll give her another season and she'll be able to work less because this show is so much a part of like her brand now. Hoping. Here's hoping. But you know what? Here's like hoping. I was thinking about it. I know some of the shows are like filming themselves in quarantine, but there's going to be like a big lull after, you know, when all the shows that should be filming right now would be airing like in a year, you know, when are we going to get a next season of Beverly Hills even? No, I have no idea. That's a great point. So something to think about. 
We have Real Housewives of New York tonight, which I'm excited about. And that's it. That's all she wrote. Make sure to go to shopmorningtoast.com after 1 p.m. Eastern time because we just launched our new face masks. There are four different options um, and they're available completely on limited stock until Sunday this week. So make sure to get them. Tell your mom, tell your brother. You have four days. Get whatever you need. Um, and make sure to order my comedy special while you're just like buying things. It's available for pre-order on iTunes. Claudia Ashray, disgraced queen. Um, you could tap the link in my bio on Girl With No Job. Thank you so much for the support and all the reviews and the ratings. I really appreciate it. I love you guys. If you're looking to take some fabulous photos this weekend, make sure to go to JackieOflow.com. Buy Jackie's new pack of presets. They are fabulous. Like I keep selling, well, I keep telling Jackie, I'm like, you got to give this person free presets. Like it's just so fabulous and you really just need it. So JackieOflow.com. Check it out. Thank you guys so much for listening to the Morning Toast, the Millennium Morning Show, where we go live Monday through Friday, 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time on YouTube. So if you're watching us, us on YouTube, please feel free to subscribe and give this video a thumbs up. We're also available as a podcast anywhere podcasts can be found. So that's Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, Public Radio. Public Radio, IR Radio, CastBox, all the places so wherever you listen to podcasts, find us. The Morning Toast and leave a five-star review about how beautiful, stunning, and smart we are. We love you guys very much. We hope you have a great day, and we'll see you tomorrow for Friday. Bye.